As you all know, we are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade. We have some incredible programming, including our Friday updates from all kinds of speakers. We have historians, authors, elected officials, activists, journalists, et cetera. Um, at next Friday, we're going to continue our series. So we decided to do a series about um, our unhoused neighbors, about, about homelessness in general. You know, oftentimes when we see people who are giving relief and aid to folks who are unhoused, um, they tend to be churches, but there are lots of secular groups who um, do that good, important, and difficult work. And so we wanted to take an opportunity to talk about some of those different groups that do that work. Um, you know, the, the Christians and other religions have not cornered the market on being a do-gooder and helping the social good. Uh, so like I said, next Friday, we're going to be talking with Carrie Kramer from 1 in 10 to talk about homelessness and the LGBTQ youth population. And like I said, we'll continue to talk about that and how we can help folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, uh, all this at a time where we are now at 14 consecutive days over 110 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, and we have legislators who, interestingly enough, in their Twitter Twitter bio, need to exclaim from the mountaintops that they are Christians or followers of God or believers in Jesus. But what they want to do is essentially torch the zone and kick all of those folks out. In fact, one senator took offense to another senator in the in the in the state Senate calling uh, people experiencing homelessness our unhoused neighbors and called a point of order. So there's not a lot of compassion necessarily. And we want to find compassionate, productive solutions to the crisis that we're facing with housing and our unhoused neighbors. So um, while we always need your financial support to do the work that we do, and we will definitely take any time, talent, and treasure that you have, I want to encourage you all to support some great local groups that we um, that are working to combat homelessness in Arizona. There is the TACO team. The TACO team, T-A-C-O, stands for Tucson Atheists, a community outreach team, and they do a lot of work in helping the unhoused, as well as just helping people in need in the Tucson area. And then we also have a really great group here in Phoenix called Atheists Helping the Homeless in Phoenix. And so I have both of those links ready to go, but I'm sure probably Lindsay is on top of it because that is what she does. Oh, look, she's already got it on there. So for now, I'm just going to go ahead and excitedly introduce our guest for today. Um, today, we will be talking with Tempe Yimby, and Yimby stands for Yes in My Backyard. They are an urbanist group which promotes pro-housing and pro-transit policies at the state and local level. Uh, Nolan Williams co-founded co Tempe Yimby in 2018 with college friends and has worked as an EMT, a crisis responder, and a real estate agent. And I'm sorry, um, Tyler, if you want to maybe also just kind of give a brief introduction of yourself and how you found your way to the Tempe Yimby group, and then we'll just go ahead and get right started with your uh, slideshow presentation. Yeah, my name is Tyler Denham. I'm joining from Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, I am a member of Tempe Yimby. Um, Definitely can't claim to have founded it or anything else. The, the credit goes to Nolan for all that. Um, but I do advocate for around a lot of the same issues for Flagstaff, Arizona. Oh, that's great. Um, so without any further delay, first of all, Nolan, did I miss anything uh, from your bio? Uh, and do you need to fill in any gaps at all for us? Or do you want to just go ahead and take it away? No, I think I think you basically got it exactly right. I would say that I didn't know what I wanted to do for a long time. And so I'm a real estate agent now because I was a YIMBY before. I was interested in this stuff for a long time before I ever started getting into real estate. But I think basically you have, you have, you basically have it. Um, the, I have this presentation that we have. It's kind of the presentation that we use as our background that we can kind of use for anybody. Um, I've emailed it over if you want to pull it up, but I, we don't we don't need the presentation. We can we can talk. I can I can use it as a guide and and just kind of talk through the stuff we want to talk through, if that works for everybody. We can't hear you. You've gone you've gone mute, my friend. All right. So she's got it up there, and just let us know when you want us to click the next slide, and we'll make that happen. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm unable to do a full screen with it. It'll shut my computer down for some lovely reason. But just let me know when you want me to move forward. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, you can you can hop into the next one if you'd like. Okay. 
So Daniel and me don't necessarily agree on when we found it, um, just because I don't remember the exact history of when things started. Uh, basically, we found it in either 2018 or 2019, when the city of Tempe wanted to create something called the Jet Urban Core Master Plan. And the idea was they were going to upzone most of the city in a little bit and really, really like by a small amount, you know, a couple stories and really heavily upzone the downtown area of Tempe. Basically, say to developers, you are now allowed to build higher density, higher height, more apartments in these areas. And it was really very heavily focused on the downtown area and had a lot of really good ideas, like density bonuses for buildings that contributed back to the public in above and beyond ways than they normally would, or that have certain number of affordable housing units in them. And we were really, really excited. And there was just a wall of no from a lot of what people tend to refer to as the usual suspects. Right. There's in our city, there's probably between 20 and 50 really, really committed, mostly retired, mostly white, almost exclusively, I would actually probably say exclusively homeowner residents. And those residents have needs that they need to get met, but they also have outsized power in local government. And they have a lot of veto powers and the ability to say no to things that might not necessarily affect them one way or the other. Right. A lot of these people are worried about height, they're worried about frontages, they're worried about the way that things look and feel, and they're not as interested in how affordable housing is, they're not as interested in how sustainable the community is, they're not as interested in how vibrant our economy is, or whether we attract more jobs, or whether we attract people with good paying jobs, or give opportunity for good paying jobs to the people that already live here. That stuff is less of their concern. They're mostly concerned to an extent about the value of their homes and just kind of the character of their neighborhood is the way that they would put it. Um, say, to, with nothing to say about what is the character of a neighborhood that excludes people. So what we see as the major problem in the state of Arizona right now is a lack of housing not just a lack of affordable housing, but a lack of all kinds of housing at all levels of the expense scale, right? There are a lot of people that live in Tempe who are students and who want to, when they graduate, they want to stay. There's a lot of people who are coming in as freshmen, but, and there's a lot of people who are coming in here for jobs. And so they, those people, because they all have different backgrounds, have a variety of different housing needs, right? From high-end luxury to stuff that is not really luxury, but they'll call it luxury because it's like a marketing gimmick, uh, to or people who need really, really low-income, subsidized affordable housing, or people who live in a place like me who might live with multiple roommates with uh, not very high rent because it's kind of an old building and maybe the landlord doesn't take care of it that much. That is... The, the broad spectrum of housing needs that the city of Tempe has. And while the city of Tempe is building more housing per capita than a lot of its neighbors, I would basically say most of its neighbors, it's, it's not close. It's not close to the amount that gets built, the what gets built, what is allowed to be built and what is feasible for developers to build is not gonna meet, not gonna totally meet the needs that we have. So basically what we want is a city that is built around people and a city that allows housing to be built for people, right? Um, the, let's see a comment, I will get to comments later. Uh, so yeah, the, um, go into the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about the population growth that we have. And I'll try to get through these slides fairly quickly so we can have plenty of time for questions. Um, the, uh, sorry, I'm on my phone so I gotta swipe. So. Arizona is growing very, very, very quickly. There's a lot of new doom saying in the news about our water, which we can get to later, but Arizona is growing very quickly. I mean, it is one of the fastest growing states in the country. Phoenix is absolutely one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, if you go to the next slide, you would see that not only are we growing at a pace of 95,000 people per year, but that is 300 people a day. And when you are in downtown Phoenix, or if you're in Tempe and you see a crane or you see two or three cranes and you think like, oh my God, there's so many cranes. They're just building so much. Uh, one crane is usually one apartment building, which is usually like 270 to 320 people, right? And that is how many people are moving to the Phoenix Metro every single day. And most of them are moving to downtown Phoenix or to places like Tempe and Chandler. Um, 
we are not building enough housing and we have not been building enough housing. We haven't built enough housing to meet our demand in a very, very long time. And what you see is, and if you could go to the next slide, um, what you see is that when you can't build up, you have to build out and you have to build into the desert and you have to build and you have to plunder Saguaros and you have to build into the mountains and you have to build into the West Valley and really, really far to the East Valley, like Queen Creek. And those are great places for people to live, um, for the people that want to live there. But if you blanket the entire desert with big suburbs that are car centric, that is not good for water use, that is not good for sustainability. So this session in the legislature, we had a senator, a Republican senator named Kaiser, Steve Kaiser. Um, I believe this is the second term. So yeah, rest in peace. Steve Kaiser's second and final term. Uh, Kaiser put forward a bill called SB 1117, or it's a Senate bill, so you could just call it 1117. Um, basically, this bill would allow for smaller homes, so smaller lot sizes in general, right? In most of Tempe, the bare minimum that you can have for a size of a backyard is like between six and 7,000 square feet, right? And the setbacks, basically what you're required to not build on, the stuff that legally you're not allowed to build on, are in my neighborhood, 30 feet to the front, 30 feet from the back, 10 or 15 feet from either side, which basically says, hey, you're only allowed to build on like 25 to 30% of your property. We want you to have huge lawns because if you can't afford to have a really big lawn and if you can't afford to spend a lot of money on space you don't use, we don't want you to live in our neighborhood. It's basically what it says. So. Kaiser's bill allowed for smaller lot sizes. It allowed for accessory dwelling units. So you might be familiar with the terms casitas or granny flats. Basically someone converts a part of their home into a second dwelling or they, they get a manufactured home put in their backyard or they build a second home in their backyard. Something smaller, you know, that is part of a larger property but can have a family member or could, you can rent it out to a grad student or you can use all kinds of places for it. Um, the bill would have allowed for more duplexes and for more triplexes, right? So houses that, you know, they're, they're single family, but they share walls, right? They're a little more energy efficient and they're more space efficient and they're typically much, much more affordable. Now they might not, you know, you might not buy a piece of land for $600,000, like they're going in my neighborhood, um, and then split it up and then get a bunch of $200,000 houses. You know, they might be still a little bit expensive, but they're going to be cheaper and they're going to, be available to a lot more people than they otherwise would. Um, finally, the bill allowed for a lot more housing near transit. So it's pretty fairly universally understood among urban planners and urban economists and labor economists that it is very, very valuable to have a lot of housing next to popular buses and trams and circulators like our orbit that we have in the city of Tempe, light rails, subways, any kind of public transit options that you have, if you can put a lot of housing near them, it's like very, very useful because a lot more people ride the transit that saves them money. It's more sustainable. And I mean, I used to take the, I used to bike to a light rail stop and ride the light rail down into Phoenix for my job when I graduated college. And let me tell you, it is super, super nice to be able to take a light rail stop to your job. And when you're done with your day, not have to sit in traffic and not have to worry about whether you're going to get hit and you can play around music, you can read, you can take a nap. It's so, so much nicer to have that option. Not everyone wants to do that, but I mean, in the state of Arizona as it is, that option isn't even available and people don't even want you to have the option. So this book came out and it got a lot of backlash very, very quickly. Uh, the primary opponent to the bill was the League of Cities and Towns, which is a organization that represents essentially city councils and mayors across the state. Uh, the League of Cities and Towns um, is good on some issues and really, really bad on other issues. And it basically breaks down to, whether they're good or bad, basically breaks down to, do our city council members and our mayorships, like as institutions, do they benefit or do are they hurt by like any specific bill, right? The city councils and mayors love power, like all politicians love power and they want control and they're scared of ever giving up power and giving up the ability to say no and giving up the ability to, to control everything. So cities have all of these really Byzantine and complicated zoning systems that say, well, you can't build this high and you can't have this much density and you need this much setback. Plus you have to develop, it has to look a certain way. And we have this 
a mission that is filled with architects and and you know busybodies who will say that you know your building has to look a certain way and if it doesn't have this color we kind of would prefer it have this color and the blinds should look certain ways um and you know you know maybe someone on the board is kind of always a problem to everyone who comes before them. And so that, you know, maybe their firm gets hired more often so that they have to recuse themselves from those meetings. Um, it's, it's, it is a system of people saying no and trying to exert their will and their control over things. Um, and so city councils really, really don't want to give it up. Uh, mayors hate giving it up. The mayor, Corey Woods, who on a local level is really, really good and does a lot of really good stuff in the city, was very bad on this issue in our city. He sent a fear-mongering letter about how your neighborhoods were going to get destroyed if we allowed more people to move in. I mean, really, really, really bad stuff that he sent using the city email to everyone on the city mailing list under his name. Um, we love Corey Woods most of the time, but on this stuff, he was, he was, really, he was really tough. So the bill could not get the support of Democrats, right? We met with a bunch of Democrats. We met with members of the leadership, especially in the Senate, and they would tell us, oh, we like these ideas. And we like, you know, oh, we think, yeah, getting rid of some parking mandates maybe would work. And, you know, maybe we want to see a lot of people get built, but we need to be sure that it's like affordable housing only is the only thing that gets built. And, you know, we don't want to give anything away to developers. And they had a lot of things that on the surface sounded fine, but boiled down to, no, we're not going to take any power away from cities. No, we're not going to allow any more housing to get built. No, we're not going to, we're not going to do anything to deal with the housing crisis until maybe we get a majority in the next cycle is essentially what we were told. Nothing is going to change for the next two years and everything is the same. Um, so when the bill failed, uh, a handful of Republicans voted for it. Almost no Democrats voted for it, except for Anna Hernandez in West Valley, who was a phenomenal, really, really great legislator. Um, it split up into three bills. So we can go to the next slide. 1161, 1163 in the Senate, and 2536 in the House. Um, these basically took all of the stuff that existed in the other bills and broke it into three little bits. So we don't need to go e over each of them. Um, the We go into the next slide, basically, uh, the League of Cities reached a deal where they would put it on the calendar. They watered everything down. They made everything not as nice. Um, and they asked much, much, much less of cities. Then they kind of wiped their hands of the whole situation and said, well, we've done a good faith effort. We've tried. We've definitely tried to address this issue. And they didn't, as far as we're aware, did not lobby very hard to get any of it to pass. Um, the, I believe it was in the House. Uh, we have to go to the next slide. Um, in the House, there were a handful of supporters. So Senator, uh, Representative Ortiz is really phenomenal on this issue. She's phenomenal on a lot of issues. I mean, I love her and is someone with vitiligo and I saw her vitiligo uh, tweets about living with it. I mean, I just, she's absolute inspiration. We love her. Um, there was bipart bipartisan support for all these bills, but in the Senate, Democrats would just not give it any support. They would not consider it. They would not even think about it. They just were absolutely dragging their feet, in part because we don't think anyone has really spoken with them about how important it is to have housing in the Valley. I mean, we are short 270,000 units in Arizona, maybe more, and we're not even currently building enough to meet the people that are moving here. I mean, the prices for rent is skyrocketing. It's, I can tell you, as someone who just started as a real estate agent and is trying to find uh, my clients like houses kind of in the high 300s to very, very low 400s. There's nothing available in Tempe. There's very little available in the places they want to live. And the places that are available are all like almost in the mid 40s to almost 50 years old and falling apart. I mean, there's some there's some places that are pretty, but it's 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 they all go very, very quickly. I mean, you put a house up on the market, if it's nice, then there is a very good chance that you have four or five offers in the first day is our, our, our experience. So there was no support in the Senate. There was, among Dems at least, there was bipartisan support in the House, but the House um, GOP, their Freedom Caucus didn't support it. And if you don't get a majority of the majority, the House GOP will not move forward on anything. Um, so it kind of Dems killed it in the Senate and Republicans killed it in the House. Um, if you go to the next slide, basically, uh, we needed legislation. We needed something. We needed anything, literally anything. And we got basically nothing. 
Um, and Democrats in the House and Senate don't seem, other than some that are really good, don't seem particularly interested in moving anything forward. And after the bills failed and after the session ended, our guy who was the only Republican actively pushing for this and like putting it forward, Steve Kaiser, he retired, he quit. He's out of, he's out of the legislature because it's a rat's nest of I don't know. It's somehow the snakes and the rats commingle. Uh, and it is a rat's nest and a snake's nest. Um, and he hated it, and so he quit. Uh, so, you know, um, if you want to flip forward to slide 11, the doom loop, um, we can talk about what happens if you don't build enough housing and what has been happening in Arizona. Um, basically, like I said before, if you don't build up, you have to build out. If you can't build in the sky, every unit not built in the sky is built in the desert. And so we are bulldozing untouched desert that is far away from everybody, that you have to drive really far to get to your job if you live there, that these houses are going to be big, they're going to have big lawns, and they're going to have a lot of grass to make up for the fact that they're far away from everything. And so they're going to be super water intensive. Um, anyone who has dealt with like urban planning on the costs of maintaining infrastructure would know that you want more units and you want more development along every foot of infrastructure that you have, right? It is easier to maintain, even though there's more traffic and even though there's more use, it is much cheaper to maintain a pipe that is a hundred feet long that has like 10 people contributing to its upkeep than, you know, a, a pipe that is 50 feet long and has one person helping it, right? It just, the math works out that you want a lot of people to be using your infrastructure because there are huge, huge benefits from having a lot of people use them. Um, but where we're building now and where we're going to keep building if we keep basically not addressing the housing crisis in the Valley by reforming our permitting process is that housing prices are going to go up. People are going to travel more. It's going to be more traffic. It's going to be more pollution. It's going to be not just gas, but also rubber off of tires, right? There's going to be more dust kicked up from people driving. Um, just kind of, there is this, this urban doom loop that happens when you don't build enough dense housing. You don't give people the option to live in the kind of dense walkable housing that naturally people tend to want to. Not everyone wants to, but a lot of people want to. And if you give them the option, they get really, really annoying about it. I don't know if you've ever met anyone from Chicago or in New York. Uh, they're insufferable. They're so annoying about how much they love those places to live. And then we look at that and we think, oh, well, we don't want to build anything like that. You know, people, Americans go to Europe, they love Europe, they talk about how amazing it is, and then they come back and they they lobby against building anything that would look like that. So we can fix this project. Um, uh, I've just skipped to the last slide. We can just skip to the last slide. Um, basically, the thing that Tempe MB thinks we need to do to fix this housing crisis is to allow dense infill housing. So to basically at the state level say that this is the bare minimum of what cities can deny. Cities can't deny certain amount of density. Cities can't deny certain lot sizes, right? I think in Paradise Valley and basically the entire city, you can only build if you are on an acre. And I think the acre is the minimum lot size for a residential house, which I think if any of us have been to Paradise Valley, you can kind of tell what message you're trying to send. They want a certain kind of person to live in Paradise Valley. A very, very specific, narrow set of people are, are able to live in Paradise Valley, and that's the way they like it. And the state should have the ability to say, no, you can't do that. You can't discriminate this way. You can't discriminate through your housing code by race or by ethnicity or even by income. You need to allow for smaller lot sizes. You need to allow for greater density. You need to allow for people to build duplexes and triplexes. You need to change your... Uh, your permitting process so that it is not unbearably slow and that it allows people to build things. You should make change your permitting process so it is easier for new builders like contractors and framers to be able to build themselves and not have to give all of the development basically to the big scary companies that can hire a fleet of lawyers to deal with all the complicated uh, personal relationships and, and legal, legal situations that you need to develop in these days. So we need to allow that stuff to happen. We have a system of many, many veto points that block that at every possible angle. And we think that that system is not working and hasn't worked and has led to really expensive housing, really bad urban form, bad public transit, and basically, uh, you know, um, 
but in an economy that is much less productive than it could be. And an American economy is very, very productive, but it could be a lot more productive if people were allowed to live near transit and if people were allowed to kill mingle and kind of have their ideas exchanged around in a more dense urban environment. So that is what we're interested in. I hope this didn't take too long. We are, if any of you have any questions, Jean? No, I mean, you didn't take too long at all. And I can see that Tyler is uh, typing an answer. You don't have to do that, Tyler, because we can just now... I'll go ahead and just read it for you. I mean, there were, oh, now it's gone though. Hold on, there, there it is, okay. So this one comes from Mark because there are a couple of com comments here that I can get to, but first let's go to Mark's question. Mark says, uh, one overarching consideration when it comes to housing is that basic sustainability of Phoenix to support an ever increasing population. As I sit here burning up in the heat, I'm reminded at how this area has changed in the 31 years that I've lived here. I've been here 32, so I get it too. When I lived here, I was at Kyrene and Elliott and it was just desert south of, mm. nothing, there was nothing there. Um, mm. So he goes on to say, which is why I am looking to leave for somewhere else, same Mark, um, isn't encouraging housing, um, perpetuating an economy that is eventually going to fail. And I can go ahead and, get us started by reading off the answer I was typing in. Sure. If the concern is sustainability, denser housing inside of urban cores is much more sustainable on every conceivable metric. Uh, dense urban housing uses less water per capita. It uses less land per capita, uh, uses less electricity per capita. Uh, those larger multifamily buildings are often much more energy efficient. Um, also, the residents that live there drive less because of their proximity to jobs and amenities. So really, the environmentally sustainable thing would be to concentrate, allow much more denser housing inside of urban cores. The opposite tact, what happens when you don't allow that dense housing is you get a lot of suburban sprawl, which is much worse on all of those same metrics. It, it's very environmentally destructive. So and if I could, if if I could, if I could cap that off as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, I I know I know some people who have moved out of the valley because they're concerned about climate change and they don't want to live here when it gets worse. And I think that's fair. And I think that's like their choice. And I I love it here because I have family here. And I love it here because I like the sunsets and I like Tempe a lot. Um, but if someone wants to leave, like I cannot control them. I can't stop them. But if someone wants to come here, America can't stop them. Like we don't have Hukau. Like we don't, you know, the internal passport system and internal migration control that some com command economies used to have, right? We cannot tell someone from California, you're not allowed to come to Arizona. People can try. And that is what a lot of people are currently doing by saying, oh, no, you shouldn't build any housing. We have no responsibility to house the people who want to come here. But people want to come here because there are jobs and because maybe they have family here or maybe they find that it is cheaper to live here. Um, I, I don't think that it is the right tact to try to eliminate all the jobs that are being created in the Valley. I don't think it's the right tact to try to discourage people by making it more expensive and less hospitable, hospitable right? Because the honest truth is that if someone can sit in a house that they bought in the 1980s and say, this place is so inhospitable to life, uh, we shouldn't allow anyone else to come here. And then they make it harder for more people to come here. They make it harder for more housing to get built. And because there is a scarcity of housing, the house that they bought in the 1980s shoots up in value. They get an insane amount of money. They get a huge amount of equity in their house. And then they sell their house and move somewhere else. Um, and they get a huge amount of money. And they have benefited from those roadblocks to new housing that they've put up. And they've moved away in the process. And I don't think that that is a fair or economically sustainable model when we could be doing what are international best practices, which are allowing, like Tyler said, more dense multifamily housing, more dense single family op options for young families and options that allow people to live kind of a more sustainable life. And I would also say that you can do a lot with shade, right? I, I know that you can't fix all problems with shade, but if anyone has any, if anyone has like a really big overarching patio, like the difference between a heavily shaded area and a non-heavily shaded area is very clear. The difference between a neighborhood that has lots of trees and plants is very, very obvious, right? If you if you're ever at like Kiwanis Park where it's all green and then you step into a neighborhood that is all asphalt, you can tell. It is very clear. And the number one 
problem with building lots of trees and tree canopy is that cars hit trees and crush them and that there's not a lot of space to put trees because you have to give that space to cars and you have to give that space to other stuff. So building a more dense, more transit and pedestrian friendly society helps push us in a better direction. There are some people who are not going to want to live here and we can't force them to stay, but there are people who want to move here and we can't force them to stay out. Right. Um, there's another question coming up from an anonymous attendee. Um, this question says, in Phoenix, the plan to concentrate high density housing housing along Central Avenue seems to be sprawling into the historic districts. Also, in recent zoning exception hearings, I almost always see a request for a reduction in parking requirements. Does light rail utilization really support these types of requests? Good question. I can go ahead and jump on the second part of that around um, parking reduction and light rail. Uh, so if there's a lot of academic research around this question and the answer is unambiguously, unambiguously yes. If people live in a dense urban core close to jobs and amenities and they have public transportation options, they have bike paths available, people will take those options. They drive much less than people who live in suburban sprawling type communities. Um, I know actually Flagstaff um, has its own data set that shows for people who live in the center of downtown Flagstaff, something like 40% of, only 40% of trips are by vehicle, whereas people who are living outside on the edge of Flagstaff, it's something like 99%. It's like every single trip is a car. Um, so yes, if people live next to those alternative transportation modes, if, if they're convenient and available, they will take them. That's what the academic research shows. You know, I can, I can get the first part, although I would add to Tyler that in the city of Tempe, at least, uh, we've talked to staff and they've told us that every parking spot, if you want to build a park, if you want to build something and you have to require parking spots, every parking spot costs $23,000 to the developer upfront, right? That is just the cost of what you're spending to build those parking spots and maintain them and not make use of them. And so a lot of projects that could build nice big apartments that are well suitable for families cannot pencil because there are such strict setback requirements and there are such strict parking requirements that you can never build a building in the shape that would allow you to profitably make the kind of apartments that would appeal to families or would appeal to kind of people with different living conditions than than young urban professionals or students. Um, I would I would say about the historic preservation if you go into Flagstaff and you look at where the historically preserved areas are, Tyler will back me up on this. I've been to Flagstaff a lot lately, um, so I can say this. Uh, you go to Flagstaff, where is the historic preservation district? Why, it's one mile away from the downtown, right? Even though downtown kind of has all the historic buildings anyway. If you go into Tempe, where is the historic preservation district? Why, they're all a mile out of downtown. If you go to Chandler, where is it? I mean, if you go, the historic mm -hmm. preservation districts in Phoenix are very, very close to downtown. They're not as close, but they're very close to downtown. And in most places, the historic buildings exist because the downtown was profitable and a productive economy. And a lot of people built nice houses near downtown because they wanted to be near downtown. And then now time has passed and some people have decided they really like those buildings and they'd like them to stay the same but they would like to keep benefiting from the downtown urban core. And they don't want the downtown urban core in the neighborhood. But I mean, the truth is the, the zoning laws and the setback requirements and all of the uh, procedural legal hurdles that you build to put in front of people being able to house other people, none of those existed when any of these historic neighborhoods were built, right? Mm -hmm. And we're, built, we're making these laws that are restricting housing in neighborhoods that were built without those restrictions. And we're then complaining that we don't have any beautiful modern neighborhoods. You know, we, we built a bunch of this stuff on human ingenuity and effort and a lot of failure. A lot of buildings are not historically preserved and were torn down because they weren't very good. But now we're producing a lot of 
middling, not very attractive buildings because we're layering in layers and layers of bureaucracy and we're not letting them get built anywhere except a handful of maybe poorer areas or maybe commercial districts. And so I would say, if you want to preserve the historical character of your neighborhood, you should have the people in the neighborhood pool resources and you should have the people in the neighborhood maintain their own property, but basically blanketing areas and saying that this is historic preservation. Well, that's, I mean, there are people who have these big, and I'm, I apologize, I'm gonna swear once. Um, they have these big, you know, they have uh, license, um, I'm, I'm doing a bumper sticker with my hands. That's what I'm making. Uh, they have these, they have these bumper stickers that say, fuck off, we're full, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want immigrants because they think this country is full. The biggest country in the world with some of the lowest population density in the world, they think it's full, right? We don't want any more. We, we're full. We don't have, we don't have room for anybody else. Well, if you have a neighborhood that was built in 1950 and you've not built any more housing in that neighborhood and all of the units are occupied and you say, we don't want anything new built here, you are saying the same thing. You are asking that you're saying, fuck off, we're full, we're happy with the people who live here and we don't owe it to anyone else and we can't benefit from anyone else, right? You're cutting yourself off. And I think, I, I understand that people like the historic character of their neighborhoods. And I think that if you do wide scale upzoning, those places are not gonna get the places that are hit the heaviest, right? But in the city of Tempe, they keep expanding what is historically designated, right? And the historic designations come when, oh, well, these buildings are at least this many years old. And then they don't let anything new get built. And then suddenly the entire neighborhood, every 10 years, the new neighborhoods pop up that are historically designated. They want to freeze the city in amber. And I, I understand some people want to maintain a historic character of the neighborhoods. But if you go to downtown Flagstaff or you go to downtown Tempe, it is investment in the buildings and in the architecture that maintains that historic character. It's not legal boundaries, hurdles, and burdens that you put in front of in front of developers, new homeowners, and renters. You know, you brought up Flagstaff, and I do have two questions here in the Q and A. But you brought up Flagstaff, um, and you know, uh, I also the legislature likes to try to, to cut municipalities off at the knees so that they can't do anything innovative or have mm -hmm, local control. Mm -hmm. Even though oftentimes it's the party that says we care about local control and small government that wants to actually take away local control and expand government. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's me on my soapbox. So my question is like, does Tucson have some of those same protections? Is Phoenix the, like the, 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 the blueprint for bad ideas? Uh, what is Tucson's approach when it comes to uh, population growth? Because I was just there recently um, in the downtown area and it looked bad and I hadn't been there for a few years. You know what I mean? And it was just like vastly different. It's like the changes that we see at ASU. You know, when I went to ASU, it looks a lot different than the than the ASU and Tempe campus looks nowadays. So does Tucson have any more innovative ideas like Flagstaff does or how does that work? Well, so what what you notice when you're in Flagstaff um, and I don't want to I don't want to make Tyler mad that I may be mischaracterizing it. But when you, you walk around Flagstaff and you look at the historic buildings, right? Uh, and you read the plaques that describe, this is what this building used to do, this is what the building does now, right? Um, this is These are the people who occupy this building at this time and at that time. It never says the city came in and demanded that they don't tear it down, right? The city came in and, and demanded that they do this thing. It's always the city came in and gave them money or this group of donors came in and gave them money or this tenant came in, this law firm decided this building is too attractive to, even though it's not a grocery store anymore, or it's not a car dealership anymore, we want to make sure this building lasts and we're going to come in and we're going to occupy it. Um, Tucson, I don't know as much about, but Tucson has a vibrant, beautiful downtown core that is, I think, a really great mix of beautiful old architecture and nice new architecture and nice new buildings. So I don't know what Tucson does. But I know that when it comes to historic preservation, I, I feel that if you're trying to preserve a neighborhood that is made up entirely of private, do private domiciles, right, Neighbor things that people can't tour, things that people are discouraged from standing in front of and looking at, things that the public is not really allowed to have access to, and you're giving them these huge uh, state property tax deductions, I think if you live in a residential house that is in a historic district, nationally registered historic district, I think in Arizona, you get like 35, 40% property tax deduction um, for homeowner. I think it's 10% for commercial. Uh, I don't know. A lot of times you talk to people in historic neighborhood and you get the sense that that is maybe the thing that they're after. It's not, you know, um, so, so I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know what Tucson is doing specifically, but I think 
I think that if you want to do historic preservation, you do it through investment and positive action rather than negative action and trying to block stuff off. Um, Sheila says 50% tax rate in Phoenix for historic property. Yeah. Oh. And I, I and and so you understand that like a historic property, if you want to maintain the structure, it's expensive. It's very, very expensive and it's not super productive because it's like hard to maintain. And so you understand that if you want to maintain a certain number of properties, then that's fine. But some people want to maintain entire neighborhoods, entire blocks, huge swaths of land because they don't want to see in any direction someone that they don't like or they don't wanna see in any direction new people or buildings that they disapprove of. And these are not things that materially hurt people. If someone wants to live in a historically designated home, then I, I think you should maybe have a handful of slots that you can give those out to, to help people maintain the structures. But also there should be some expectation that the public has a right. If the public is giving you a 50% property tax break on historic structure, the public should have some right to access that structure, or at least it should be, you know, on a path with plaques and stuff talking about it. I, mm -hmm. so it, you know, you, you have to, there's, there's a lot of trade-offs and, and yeah. some, some people want the, the city to have never changed. And some people enjoy the new restaurants and they enjoy all the amenities they get and they enjoy the job opportunities and the good schools they can send their kids to, but they want the built structure to have never changed and for no people, no new people to have ever shown up. And you asked, is Phoenix a blueprint for this bad stuff? No, LA is a blueprint. Los Angeles is a blueprint. <laughs> San Francisco is a blueprint. And it's, and those are two cities that frankly, uh, should be paradise, and in many ways for a lot of people are, but those should be mega cities. You know, those should be world-class, enormous cities with a, a lot of people being able to access the awesome stuff that exists in those cities, the great weather, the opportunities, the ocean, but those opportunities don't exist because in the 20s, I think it was in the 20s, and if any of you have read The Color of Law, you'd be familiar with this, um, a long time ago in New York and concurrently in LA and San Francisco, there are people who decided we do not like the Chinese or we do not like this ethnic group and we want to create legal burdens to keep them from existing. And so that's what we're going to do. And that is where zoning comes from. And it has a history of very clear and obvious racial segregation and oppression. And none of those laws changed. And now everybody uses those laws as cover to say, oh, well, we care about this or oh, well, we care about that. Or it really matters that we're doing historic preservation, you know, and what they're preserving is laws that were racially, you know, discriminatory at their very founding. Well, I can't believe you on that count because I just heard a politician say like yesterday that racism is over and that America oh, yeah. does not have a racism problem. So nice well, okay. well, you know, in just that kidding. Case, well, fine. Yeah. In that, in that case, it's fine. You know, we've obviously solved it. So yeah. 100%, yeah. Um, so here's an interesting one. This comes from another at anonymous attendee uh, and they say city planner here in Mesa. Have you worked much yet with this Mesa City Council? I've only lived here about one and a half years, but every time we present a development to council proposing to provide less than the required amount of apartments, the council always brings up their concern providing enough parking and people parking on the street. It drives this person crazy. <laughs> Well, I can, yeah, yeah. So I I've have not worked with Mesa, but I can comment on the general principles there. Um, yeah. So parking these minimum what they're referring to is minimum parking requirements, and at, it's an aspect of zoning that says uh, you have to have a certain number of parking spots per unit per person in a development. Um, you can add as many as you want, like typically. There's no maximum, but there is a minimum you can't go below. And these are really important to housing affordability because parking, contrary to popular belief, is not free. Parking is never free. Um, parking is actually very expensive in terms of the land cost that it takes and also the construction and maintenance. And uh, by requiring a minimum amount of parking, you're essentially inflating the cost of the rent or if it's commercial, you're inflating the cost of the goods and services that are being sold there. Um, there's a lot of academic study on this again, and they consistently show something between 17% to 25%, depending on the locality and the type of parking provided, uh, that percentage increase in the housing costs. So it is a big factor. Um, and it also ties in the transportation. So for a lot of reasons, um, you know, reducing traffic congestion, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We want people to drive less. 
Um, and part of that is building a lot of housing close to urban cores, close to jobs and amenities, close to transit. But the impact of doing that is very muted if every single one of those developments is required to provide a huge amount of parking. Um, by providing that huge amount of parking, you're essentially subsidizing people to come and bring cars. Like someone who previously, you know, maybe budget is tight, so maybe I won't get a car. I'm gonna leave, live in this area really close to everything I need and I'm gonna walk and take the bus. Um, but in this case, they're already having to pay for a parking spot because the parking was required by the city. So, you know, there's no way they can get rid of that cost. They might as well bring the car. We've subsidized it. We've made the option easier. And it's just harder to get people out of cars when we're subsidizing it with all these parking minimums. And I'll say that parking minimums make smaller developments almost impossible. So there's a concept called missing middle housing. Um, it's housing types from like duplexes to townhomes, you know, anything that's in between a small single family home and a large, very dense apartment building. Mm -hmm. And parking requirements in particular kill these projects. Um, they just, they don't pencil out with parking requirements. And you would need some kind of rezone or variance to build it without the parking. But no small developer is ever going to bother they, they don't have the time, they don't have the capital, and they don't have the lawyers to muddle through the process. And larger developers who do have the time, the money, and the, and the lawyers to request a rezone or a, revari or a variance, they're never going to bother with those smaller projects. So yeah, in short, parking is a very big issue, and it ties into a lot of different aspects of this. Mm, sounds and like if, if I could answer about have we worked with Mesa. Um, We've not worked specifically with Mesa. We've kept an eye on some of the stuff Mesa has done, and we have some people who live in Mesa that are maybe interested in helping us expand into there. But in our experience, the way that we operate, Tempe and B, we do lobbying to city council members and state legislators to change the processes so that we allow that stuff by right or that we allow that stuff sufficiently in a way that developers know how to make it happen, right? So maybe you say this is by right if you do these things, right? Like if you have affordable housing or if you can give us a reasonable estimate of how many people are going to drive, this or that, you know, if you do all that, then we'll let you do this. We we lobby on behalf of allowing that stuff to happen. And then when really good projects that support affordable housing come to the state legislature, we bring people there and we show up and we voice our support so that the city council there knows that, yeah, you guys might have questions about parking, but we do not. And we want to see a building without a lot of parking because that is important to us. And we have a, a development like that called cul-de-sac in Tempe that's going up that has very, very diluted amount of parking and it's very transit and pedestrian oriented. But like we, we bring people to show city council that they care. But the most important work is not at the city level. The most important work is at the state level because cities have proven time and time again that the power incentives of city council and of the mayorship demand that they have as much veto power over all of the development that happens in their city. And when you have those structures of power in place, less stuff gets built and housing gets more expensive. And so we want to change. So in the meantime, we go to these city council meetings and we talk to them and we do that stuff. But then we go to the state legislature and then we go to the state legislature. People like Stacey Travers say very condescending to us, condescendingly to us, well, why don't you just run for mayor? And it's like, well, you have a responsibility as well. As the state legislator, you have resp responsibility to state issues such as affordability and problems where they're in. So we, I've posted in the... Uh, what is it? I've posted in the chat. It's pretty far up. It's not letting me post it again. Um, I think it thinks it's spam. I, I believe I've posted a list of links in the chat. Um, if someone could scroll up and confirm, and if you can, if, if one of the hosts, if you guys could copy and paste it and bring it back down again. Um, if you live in Mesa and are interested in getting involved, and I know it's uh, harder for um planners, right? It's obviously more difficult for people who are in government. But if you want to have a conversation about getting involved, or if you want to help us, or if you want to start your own group in another city, or start a group for five cities, or start a bike club or something, if you're interested in any of that, we have this link that you can basically fill out a small survey, and it'll tell you, here's, how, here's what I want to do. Here's the involvement that I'm comfortable with. Here's where I live. Here's kind of this situation, and that situation. Here's my email, my phone number. Um, share that stuff and we'll get in contact with you and we'll talk about what it is that you want to do and what we can help with. Um, 
We have a newsletter that you can follow on our website. If you go to our website, we have social media pages, all that stuff. But we have a couple people in Mesa that are interested in our work, but are not super familiar with it. And so we haven't been able, we've, we've talked to, but we haven't been able to meet in person. Um, I think there probably is a lot of demand for this kind of stuff in Mesa, as well as in, in Tempe. Um, we just got to meet those people. We got to talk to them. We got to get something going. So. Uh, okay. There's one more question here in the question and answer. And this one comes from Trevor. He says, can you talk a little bit about what single, single stair reform is? Oh yeah, yeah. Trevor's Trevor's one of our guys. We love Trevor. Uh, Trevor is a Chandler and Tempe guy. He he splits his time because he's a student. Um, so there there are a bunch of reforms that you can do that are very code oriented. They're very technical that would potentially help developers make more use out of the land that exists. Um, a lot of these programs and a lot of these reforms will take a little while because developers and contractors and framers and fire inspectors are all used to things being a certain way and they have to get used to changes. But one of these reforms is called single stair or point access blocks, or I don't think it's bow house, there's a passive house. There's, there's a passive house is a different thing. If you, if you look up single stair, you'll get this guy who talks about passive house all the time. He doesn't explain anything, it's very annoying. Uh, but single stair is basically, when you look at apartment buildings that are above a certain height in America, usually above three stories, basically any place that has to have sprinklers, right? Or well, any, any place that has to have like special stairwells and special types of sprinklers. And I think anything with elevators, essentially, you are required by fire code and by building code to have two stairwells built a certain distance. I think it's 150 feet away from each other. And all people who live in any hallway or any specific part of the building have to have access to two different stairwells on either side. Right? Um, in Europe, they don't have this and their fire fatality rate is basically the same as ours is for their multifamily housing. In America, the fire fatality is much higher because we have more single family homes, but that's like beside the point. Um, and single family homes don't have sprinklers and sprinklers are amazing. They're, I mean, they're like God's life-saving miracles. They're incredible. Uh, the, the idea of single stair reform is that you allow builders to build with a single stair, access to a single stair and sprinkler and have all the other safety features, but just one means of egress instead of two. And it would allow you to, I wish I could draw a diagram for you. Basically, if you go to a hotel, or if you go to a new apartment building, they're all built similarly, which is they have these long, dead corridor hallways and rooms on either side, right? And then two stairwells at either, two stairwells and escalators on either side of the hallway. It's kind of dead and it's hard to build apartments that are shaped for families in that configuration. Right. If you build on single stair, you can have a very narrow tall building with a smaller, um, a smaller, floor plan. Someone is tweeting under my name because I give them my link. That's not me. So don't believe that that's me typing. Um, but uh, you can have a smaller, narrower building with a single stair that goes right up the middle and, a, and three or four rooms that are kind of around like the central stairwell, right? And it, it's, it's technical and it's wonky, but the upshot is essentially you can build bigger rooms in smaller buildings, and that is more affordable and more efficient, and it encourages development that is cheaper in for rent usage because they're making more use of the land that they have, and it's, it's more profitable per square foot without necessarily being higher priced, and it allows you to build rooms that are suited to families, rooms that have windows on either side so that you can get cross breeze coming in, rooms that have a big master bath, master bedroom and smaller little bedrooms for kids. I mean, there's a lot of things that is very, just in a technical wonky way, difficult to do under the current legal code that we have. And one of the reforms people really like is single stair. And so that's that's why Trevor had us, had us pull it up. But there's a lot of stuff like that. And there's, and, and there's a lot of changes that can be made to the American co building code that, that would do a lot of wonders. And a lot of states are trying to do that. And so that's part of the YIMBY movement is figuring out what works and what is effective and what are the trade-offs that we can make and, and what are really not trade-offs. Because like single stair isn't like really a trade-off because it wouldn't, you would, you would have to train the fire departments again, but buildings take a long time to build so they'd have time to train. And if you've ever known firefighters, that's all they do all day is train. That's like most of their job is training. Um, love them, great guys. So yeah, single stair. 
Right on. Well, thank you for that. Let's see. It is 1256. If there are, I'm going to just go ahead and sort back through the comments. It's kind of interesting that there are a couple trolls here. It's been a minute since we've had some trolls. So I guess we're doing oh, something we right. There yeah. were a couple of trolls. They were, you know, asking really colorful questions in the chat, which I just mm -hmm. take as a compliment. It means that people are paying attention to the work that Secular AZ does. So wait, yay. give me one. I want to take one. Give me one. Oh no, you don't you don't want to see these. No, it had it involved two you, you girls. You don't want to trust yeah, me. You don't, yeah, trust. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, Mars has a uh Mars has a recommendation here. Um okay. Mars says they read two books recently about zoning and parking laws. No mm -hmm. wonder people can't live anywhere. Um, where was that? Because uh, you Mars recommended the book. Hold on, let me see if I can go back and find it. Arbitrary the book was. Yeah. Arbitrary, Arbitrary lines. lines by Nolan Gray and the parking related one was Paved Paradise, How Parking Rules the World by Henry Grabar. Uh, those are both excellent books. I've read them. If you're interested in the parking issue, if that's something you've never heard about before, there's actually a 30 minute uh, podcast from Slate Magazine that is with the author, Henry Gabar of that book. If you've only got 30 minutes and you're interested in the topic, I would highly suggest listening to that. And then if it continues to pique your interest, go and read the book. Right on. Um, so seeing, let's see, there were just basically some uh, comments here. Uh, John says the original zoning on his 1946 Tucson commercial building prohibited Chinese ownership. Yeah. That's uh, crazy. That is, usually it's not as explicitly spelled out. I saw that comment that's insane yeah um and let's see one more uh, this is probably just another link down there so um all right it is 12 58 i want to honor everybody's time um you really educated me a lot on um what is happening with housing because like i walk around all the time and i'll uh, you know i'll see like I don't understand why can't we build up, you know, uh, why are there these vacant lots that nobody's developing and, you know, it, it, so you really answered a lot of questions and and we really need to, you know, once again, going back to the legislature, finding people who are going to be commonsensical, practical problem solvers who really want to solve this issue of housing instead of playing politics. So yeah. I appreciate it. Um, What's something that maybe can give us some hope on this Friday with regards to housing or, or, you know what, how can we support what the work that you do? So for hope, I would say, if you look to the state of California, they have built a coalition that is pushing through a lot of very interesting and good reforms. The, a lot of it may be because the interest rates are so high or because builders aren't used to it yet or they haven't really hit the meat of it yet. A lot of it is still in its early stages, so we haven't seen huge results from all of it yet. Um, most of it's only like a year or two old, and it takes a while for this stuff to work. But California is very interesting in terms of the kind of coalitions that you can build again and get a lot of stuff done. And then you look at states like Montana, which have no coalitions and have nothing planned, and they have one guy who cares about it and suddenly gets these huge bills through, right? Um, so this, there is, this is a growth industry in terms of issues that exist that are bipartisan, or I would even say like cross-partisan, issues that don't necessarily map onto partisan political interest, but have huge demand for them based on the fact that people cannot afford to live in the places where they live, and the defenses of the status quo are very flimsy. Um, there is a lot of movement and growth in this area, and if you would like to be a part of that, you can follow our newsletter. You can go to one of those links that we posted and fill out that survey. Even if you don't live in Tempe, fill out our survey because there's a section on where you live and we can get you, if you're interested, contacted with other people that are in that area, or we could just keep you updated if you want. Um, we could just like let you know stuff when it happens. Um, the, the other thing that I would say is that this is a problem that exists at every level of the government in some way or another, right? At the federal government, they have the fair cloth amendment that says you cannot build socialized housing or the federal government can only su financially support X number of, of social housing units. At the local government, they don't wanna give up any of their control. At the state level government, they're ab obstinate and do not think that they have a responsibility over it. But there is a lot of the bastions of support for the bad status are weaker than you would think they are, right? A lot of them respond more 
a lot of them are not used to being pushed. A lot of them are not used to having people question them or question the morality of their choices. A lot of them are not used to having any sizable number of people basically say, hey, the thing that you're trying to do is gonna hurt me really badly, right? Because the people who usually respond to these are people who support the status quo and the people who are disenfranchised don't usually respond. But there is massive, I mean, massive potential for growth in this area. I mean, we have had four happy hours and the number of people who have attended our happy hours, which are super fun, you should come, even if you don't live in Tempe, you should come. The number of people who have attended our happy hours was four, three, 16, and then 25, right? Wow. The, and it, a lot of those people we haven't met, a lot of those people aren't involved. Some of them are like real old real estate people. Some of them are like policy nerds. A lot of them are just people who heard about us on Twitter, right? And there is a hunger in the American population for change that will make housing more affordable. So it there is a lot of stuff that needs to get pushed back on. And we have a lot of big cultural changes in the business world and policy changes in the government world that need to be done. But there's a lot of people who are willing to do it. And it is fun. It is, it is actually very... It, the going up and speaking at a public meeting is by itself not fun. And that's why nobody does it. But we try to make it fun and we have a good community and it is just, it's it's good atmosphere. Hey, speak for yourself. I make it a hobby to go to public meetings and speak because I don't know, I, I, I it's better than punching myself in the face, I guess. So um, <laughs> anyway, it has been really my pleasure to meet both of you, Nolan and Tyre, Tyler. I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I'm going to go ahead and fill out that Google form because at first I wasn't going to since I don't live in Tempe, but I will I will get it done. And who knows, you might just see me at a happy hour. Hey, we have people write op-eds. We have other stuff. It would, it would be awesome to have you. Right on. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you all. And I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Stay cool because it's hot out there. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.